by the time I got to the television, <laughs> it was so much like, oh, they're going to drag this through every possible venue they can. We said, you know, maybe we can turn this into a syndicated television show. The show that wound up being Nightmare on Elm Street, Freddy's Nightmares. It was going to really be this novel approach to television. This was the promise I was told, that we were going to be on late at night and we could be dark. And, and we could really push the envelope. This show gave a lot of uh, sort of up-and-comers a chance to, uh, you know, to get, get a start. Anybody who wanted to direct one could direct one. Anybody who wanted to be in one could be in one. Anyone who wanted to write one could write one. They had a guest star every single week. Brad Pitt's in there. Ah! Mariska Hargitay. I got to decapitate Laurie Petty. Not many people have that in their resume, and I'm proud of it. It was interesting having done a Friday the 13th TV series and then a Nightmare on Elm Street TV series. Both things really didn't represent what the movie franchise were. Freddy's Nightmares as a concept was always anthological and to have him introduced, he was the Crypt Keeper, he was Alfred Hitchcock, he was Rod Serling. We were going to call ourselves like a, to be a dark, violent Twilight Zone with Freddy as a sort of host and participant. I think they basically had him in for, you know, a one day, two days or whatever and did all those things uh, so he didn't have to go in and out of the makeup. He was only in the wraparounds really to my episode, but they also asked me to do two of the other wraparounds aside from my show. And those were getting shot at the same time you were doing your episode, so you would literally run to another set which was not in the same building, do the stuff with Robert England, and as soon as you, you know, cut, you ran back and did your other shot on the other stage, so it was crazy. Freddy's Nightmare is certainly a nightmare in many respects. I mean, in a way it was like film school because I learned how to really be well prepared when you came onto the set, because you were doomed otherwise. The only thing I remember about the series was it was so cheap, 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 cheap. No one's perfect, Bubblehead! The budgets were, were quite low, and they went lower as, as time went on. I would say by the 10th one, they were pretty miserable, and I stopped paying attention. They really didn't care about the show. It was just a cash cow, and so we just ran amok. I mean, we'd do whatever it was that we wanted to do. Action! Blendomatic! Ah! <laughs> All of the early episodes were originally intended to be two half hours that were vaguely linked. And I would say the first five or six episodes are pretty good. In fact, I play significantly in one of them. If you ever see the pilot for the Freddy's Nightmares, you'll know what this show is supposed to be. The No More Mr. Nice Guy episode of Freddy's Nightmares was great because it was the backstory of Freddy Krueger. It's the history of how Freddy became Freddy. Toby Hooper did the, uh, the pilot. He's one of my favorite directors and people in Hollywood. And Toby did this dark, wonderful pilot. Springwood's Nightmare are just beginning. My daughter at that time was 15 years old or something like that, and she just had a birthday, and I got Robert to wish her happy birthday on camera. Happy birthday, Robin. What are you, 15? <laughs> she was like the star of her school, you know? <laughs> Bet you wish you had a learner's permit, or better yet, a driver's license. Too bad you're not gonna see sweet 16, bitch. <laughs> We really crossed the boundaries quite often in terms of what was acceptable on commercial television. Freddy's Nightmares was very politically incorrect. That was part of the fun of it. Yeah! Oh, him, cowboy! He got any saddle sword yet? You could go places that no other show would let you go. There are scenes of uh, relatively graphic sex and violence. We, we did shoot a lot of extra footage, so to speak, that we just go, oh yeah, let's have her naked in the shot or something like that. Knowing full well none of this would wind up in the show. You know, or we'd have some bloodbath knowing that it was going to get cut anyway, so we just do it. There was lots of that stuff. I mean, one of the ones I directed had like a full peck and palm male on female violent sequence. Because it was syndicated, it played at different times in different markets. And each of the stations could put it on whenever they wanted to. But what happened was they put us on at four and five, six o'clock in the afternoon in the Bible Belt. And there was all this reaction and complaining. The network is so, it clamps down heavily on censorship issues. The safe sex episode, which was the last episode they bought for the first season, they said, cut out eight minutes. <laughs> Time for the Big Bang, Jerry Bomb. It really was not great television. I can't bear to watch them now because they're just, you know, they're just 
so whacked. How about I make you a bloody hairy? <laughs> it was fun. It was fun to do. It has not stood the test of time. I blame to some extent the quality of the, of the, of the production that, that really uh, hastened its demise. Our crew from Freddy's Nightmares, when we were canceled, went over and took over Tales of the Crypt and single-handedly brought down the budget of that show so that it was manageable, or that show would have been long gone too. <laughs> Some episodes are, are, are really great, really stand the test of time. Uh, anyhow, that was, it was a lot of fun, but it was incredible, I I incredibly uh, abrasive to your soul to have to write one of these things uh, to keep constantly turning, churning out uh, these scripts. Well, the good news about doing this show was there had been no pattern set. But um, they were always very encouraging. They wanted feature filmmakers to come in and, and give it feature film style. You know, we just played with things that weren't costly to do, but sort of were off-putting and bizarre. And the producers just said, okay, as long as we're making the money, we don't care, just go do it. <laughs> you really just wanted to put every idea that you could possibly put into it, want to be absolutely as loyal as you could to the franchise, but at the same time want to be creating something that wasn't quite the franchise and that they basically gave us a lot of freedom. And after you write paragraph after paragraph of stuff and it doesn't work, you come up with a one-liner idea on the couch in the office. And they go, that's great, do it. And, and the idea was, Freddy is some goth girl's dream date. And this became the safe sex episode, which is the last episode they bought for the first season. The teleplay for Freddy's Nightmare was too sexy to broadcast because we had to cut eight minutes out of the show. This episode was what they called a Freddy show, meaning a show that Freddy was a character in the show as opposed to the host. There were four or five of those throughout the, the series run. And between uh, the sexy aspect of high school students wanting to get laid and Freddy butchering them uh, in extravagant ways, uh, they said, cut out eight minutes. And, th and that's a process, you probably know, that's a process whereby you trim some, it's not good enough. You trim some more, it's not good enough. It's like dealing with the MPAA. We won't tell you what to cut, just cut it until we say it's okay. Which is kind of like the parent that walks into the room and smacks a little kid in the head. And the kid goes, what did I do? And the parent goes, you should know. I directed the second episode filmed of Freddy's Nightmares called Killer Instinct. So basically it was the story of two competing high school athletes, female athletes, Lori Petty and Yvette Niper. And uh, they were uh, runners, high school runners, and, and great athletes and all, and, and they had a great deal of competition. And it turns into a ghost story, and there's a beheading at the finish line and all of this stuff. So I, I must admit that I saw it when they just started rebroadcasting these shows on DirecTV, I didn't, or on Chiller. I didn't even realize that the show was coming back, and it had been many years. I'm just flipping through the guide, and I see Freddy's Nightmares. I wonder, and I flipped it on, and it was mine, and I watched it, and my face just turned red. It's, it's certainly the worst thing I've ever done, my worst work as a director, um, but it was fun. One of my all-time favorite, if not my favorite movie of all time, is It's a Wonderful Life. So when I got the script saying it's a miserable life, um, I thought, well, that's perfect. Because the guy is, has to get out of this town. He does not want to be stuck in this town in his father's business for the rest of their life, his life. Poor kid works in a you know, burger stand, and his dad wants him to inherit the business, and he just wants out of you know, Springwood. And he, you know, he hates this town. He hates you know, his life is going nowhere. And then fate steps in, and this uh, drive-by shooter you know, fires at him. It was what goes through his mind just before the bullet actually hits. The opportunity to work with an iconic figure in horror was the main draw. And to create that friendship with Robert that we've had since then. You know, the, ni the Nightmare on Elm Street experience is an important one to have. Freddy Krueger is kind of the king of monsters of the last couple of decades, and, and that's a fantastic uh, accomplishment. I think that the sad thing that there isn't a Freddy's Nightmares now. There was a number of those shows where if you were, uh, you know, a budding director, you had a chance to, like, try your wares out because, you know, that's really the only way you're going to get um, experience, you know. And nowadays, you know, you've got to come out of the box. Your first movie better do $300 million or you're dead. That's it. You're, you know, it's going to be 10, 15 years before you get another shot, if ever.
you know, the fact that it lasted two years is great and an incredible testament to it. But they weren't really Nightmare on Elm Street stories because you don't want to use those up if you still have a successful franchise of feature films.